So thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. I'm Yanis Valauta uh, from Atfinis, and today we have the pleasure to learn a lot from free experts in their field. We have today here um, Kapil from HashiCorp, we have Bastion from SUSE, and we have Rob from, from Atfinis. And these three great minds are today talking about Vault and how it can be run in SUSE Kubernetes platform rancher. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to write them in the chat. We have some experts from at Finis and I think also from our partner companies here today, they can answer that. And of course the speakers can answer them. And as I already said, we will record, everything is recorded. We will send you the recordings afterwards so you, you don't miss anything. And of course we are always free uh, here to, to help you with any questions that come up afterwards. So with that, I give over to Rob for a short, uh, short introduction on his person. Thanks so much. and. We will see each other later. Thanks, Janis, for the good start of the day, yeah, to be called uh, an expert in the field or something. That feels pretty good. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Robert de Bock. I indeed work for Adfinis. Uh, so not for Susan, neither for HashiCorp. Uh, so that makes us a bit independent. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we use both products quite frequently. So uh, that's what I'm here to show you in a bit. Um, yeah, during the presentation, collect your questions. At the end, there's a possibility to ask some questions too. So there's a bit of a Q&A at the end. And now I'll, I'll give the word to Kapil. Thank you, Rob. Uh, hi, my name is Kapil Arora. I'm a senior solution engineer uh, here at HashiCorp based in Germany. Uh, I've been here for one and a half year. I have a lot of experience in open source technologies, have been working on Kubernetes uh, for the past four or five years, also have been certified uh, both as administrator and developer. So I uh, have collected some experience in that field and work and prefer using the platform a lot uh, to do also my demos, for example. And uh, I will be talking about Vault today and, uh, and helping to, to light uh, or to Put some light on on the topic of secret management and now i will pass it on to bastian uh, who will then talk about rancher and also introduce himself thank you Thanks. and also good morning from me uh, my name is bastian hofmann i'm a field engineer at SUSE, and i mainly focus on everything related to kubernetes containers um, cloud native technologies and especially then of course also our rancher uh, and related product offerings and i'm going to kick it off today with giving you a bit of introduction about kubernetes how rancher can help you to manage kubernetes and how this relates then to secret management and why the combination of ranch and world is a very good fit there before we go into the details on that, I would like to take one step back and set a bit of the stage and maybe talk about why we're even talking about Kubernetes and all these things. And this in the end goes down to, well, goes back to containers. Containers have been around for, I don't know, 10 or so years, and they are great and a great way to package and deploy your software because with using containers, you can package your applications that you are writing, the software that you want to deploy into self-contained and portable images. And you can take one of these container images, put it on any kind of server that only needs a container runtime as a dependency, and you can start the container, you can stop it, and then you have a clean system again. It makes it very easy to deploy things, it makes it very easy to run things in a very standardized way. So instead of having to create your own automations, your own deployment scripts, uh, your own supervisors for your processes, for every different technology that you're using, you can standardize it. And in the end, you can think of it, it's basically like containers in shipping. Instead of having to package everything differently and handle everything differently, all the cargo you're doing, you standardize on a single container format. And as I said, containers are very great because it makes it easy to deploy, to run software in a standardized way. 
And if you have one or two or three containers that you need to run somewhere, um, and maybe one, two, three servers that you want to run these containers on, managing these containers is very easy. You install a container runtime on all of your servers, and then you can decide, okay, this container should run here, this container should run here, you start them up, you set up the network in between them, and you're done. The problem rises because usually our environments, our systems are more complex than just one, two containers on one, two servers. Usually our environments, our complex applications with microservices, with monitoring demons and so on, look, look more like this. We have lots of applications, lots of processes, lots of containers because of that, that are running on lots of different servers. The standardization of containers is still great and makes our life a lot easier, but then just the decision which container should run on which server. How do we set up networking? How do we ensure um, that our system is secure and securely set up and a container only has the privileges it should have? How do we even handle things like updates of an application in a way that we don't have a downtime of the application itself? That becomes a lot more challenging if our environment grows larger and larger. And of course, we can start to build up our own automation for that and write our own scripts, write our own tooling. And that will take a lot of time and we will probably focus a lot, of, a lot on these automations. And this is time where we actually can't focus on what's important, writing and maintaining and making our own application great. The, fortunately, because of the standardization of containers, there are already solutions out of that that can help you to address these challenges. And the yeah, de facto standard nowadays for managing and orchestrating all the containers on different and multiple servers is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestration system and you install it on all of your servers. They form a cluster in a very simplified terms. And then you can tell Kubernetes, I have these containers, please Kubernetes run them, them somewhere where it makes the most sense, where there are enough resources for it and handle starting, stopping the containers, handle deployments, handle updates of them and so on. And one great thing about Kubernetes is that it's very flexible. Nowadays you can run it everywhere, starting from your developer laptop to make development standardized and easier up to your big cloud environments or your own data centers. But apart from these standard use cases, Kubernetes now also more and more becomes the platform to run software and applications also on any kind of edge or IoT scenarios and devices. And that could be then a 5G cell tower, or it could be a supermarket store where you have a couple of servers and you want to deploy your software for inventory management, for example. It could be a factory where you deploy and use Kubernetes to run software on industry PCs that take sensor data and do machine learning on them. Think industry 4.0 as a buzzword. But it could also be self-driving cars, trains, planes, and even satellites in space nowadays run Kubernetes to orchestrate and manage the software on them. And then on all of these different infrastructures, Kubernetes again creates a standardized layer that allows you, as I said, to deploy your containers in a standardized fashion to update them, but it also cares about all the other necessary things to actually run software in a clustered environment in a highly available fashion. So things like networking, service discovery, auto scaling, health checks, load balancing, role-based access control, and backup and disaster recovery. So it is a very powerful tool. And it solves a lot of problems with a standardized API so that the differences of all the different environments on your laptop, in the data center, in the cloud, or on the edge are then um, yeah, made the same. And you have the same 
API, the same standardized set of APIs to deploy your applications on a cluster environment. So that's really great and can reduce the effort of maintain maintenance a lot. If we look a bit more detailed in how such a Kubernetes cluster looks like from an architecture point of view, um, and this diagram here is a bit simplified to make it able to fit on, this, on the slide, we can see that, of course, Kubernetes is a distributed system because you install it, as I said, on multiple servers, and then the different Kubernetes components have to communicate with each other. And if you look at such a Kubernetes clusters, you can see that there are different roles of components involved. You have the Kubernetes control plane here in the middle, which provides the Kubernetes API that as a user, as an operator, you can talk to, to tell Kubernetes, hey, I want to deploy these containers and I want to set up networking in this way, for example. Kubernetes then has its own database, its own storage to save the state of the cluster, the state the cluster should be in. And this storage is called etcd. It's a distributed key value store. And here on the right side, we have then all the so-called worker nodes. These are the nodes that also run a small Kubernetes component. They frequently ask the Kubernetes control plane, the API, hey, I'm this node, I have that many resources available. Kubernetes, which containers, which applications should I start? Which containers should I stop? And then they report also back their status. So lots of different components. And I said it's even simplified because the control plane also consists of multiple different microservices. And these components need to communicate with each other. They need to communicate with each other securely. They need to be configured in a consistent way, which is all doable, but can take a lot of time just to set everything up and set everything up properly in a highly available way. So that also your Kubernetes cluster itself does not go down when one of your servers is going down. If you want to set it up by hand, there are actually great documentation and tutorials to do so. Um, you can see here on the screenshot, this is a tutorial from Kelsey Hightower called Kubernetes the hard way, which tells you really how to set up all the different Kubernetes microservices, including certificates and all the configuration from scratch on your own. It is very detailed and it's lots of steps as you can see. It's also very interesting to try it out once and you learn a lot by that by doing that, but you also learn that you probably don't want to do this in production yourself because then just managing Kubernetes becomes a huge amount of work. And again, that would be time that you can't spend on your own applications because you're spending it on managing your infrastructure. I always like to co compare this a bit with Linux because you also could start compiling a complete Linux kernel and configuring everything and all your packages from scratch, which is also very interesting and you learn a lot by that, but it's time you usually don't want to spend in production. And instead, you usually use some kind of Linux distribution to that is a bit more opinionated and helps you to set up Linux much easier. And the same is happening for Kubernetes now. Instead of you having to do everything from scratch, there are multiple Kubernetes distributions out there with multiple different decisions that uh, make it a lot easier for you to set up Kubernetes and maintain it and upgrade it. And one of them is RKE, the Rancher Kubernetes Engine. It's a Kubernetes distribution, which gives you 100% upstream Kubernetes. And this Kubernetes distribution is also certified by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation to be 100% standard compliant. And the great thing is it makes it very easy for you to install it. Um, it also allows you out of the box to have zero downtime upgrades. If you want to upgrade your Kubernetes distribution to a new version, it handles backup and disaster recovery and also has a full air gap installation support so that you can also run it easily in scenarios where you don't have internet connectivity at all or very limited internet connectivity. 
And such a distribution like RKE makes it a lot easier to set up Kubernetes. And if you have a couple of Kubernetes clusters, like one production cluster, maybe one dev cluster, and you set them up with a distribution, that's very easy. You can just do it. You set it up on a couple of servers, and it's probably OK to manage one or two clusters. But we are seeing more and more, if you move more and more of your applications, of your stack to Kubernetes, that you end up not only with one or two clusters, but quickly with multiple clusters. So kind of like the same slide as you saw with containers, just now with Kubernetes clusters. Why is that? First of all, oftentimes you not only have a dev and a production environment, maybe you also have a staging environment, a QA environment, and you quickly end up with three, four, five clusters for all the different environments. And it's probably also a good idea to not mix everything together to make resource management and secure, security management in terms of access control easier. And then you could start thinking, OK, maybe it would also be great in a dev environment to not only have one central dev environment, but maybe give every team their own environment to reduce yeah, friction and to reduce the risk that one team changes something on dev and other teams are affected by it. But also in production, it could become necessary to not only run one cluster, but maybe multiple ones because you have multiple data centers that are maybe even globally distributed. Um, it could be that you also now want to run third party software that you're not completely trusting, you say, because of regulations or policies, you want to put it into a separate cluster, separate from your own applications. Or maybe you have workloads that you need completely different hardware, like machine learning workloads. Maybe you also want to scale out some workloads to the cloud, but keep others on premise in your own data center. And then there's of course the whole IoT and edge scenario where you quickly end up with thousands, tens of thousands or even millions of clusters because every um, wind turbine, every car, every train would be its own small Kubernetes cluster. And then it actually becomes challenging to set up and manage all the different Kubernetes clusters by your own, even with the distribution, and also to keep them up to date, even with the distribution. And that's where Rancher comes in. Rancher is a multi-cluster Kubernetes management platform that you can use to manage everything from one to thousands or even millions of Kubernetes clusters centrally from a central plane of glass from a central management system, regardless of the underlying infrastructure. So all your different Kubernetes cluster, uh, regardless if they're running in the data center, in the cloud, or on the edge, and also regardless of the Kubernetes distribution. It could be an RKE distribution. It could also be any kind of other cloud-native certified Kubernetes distributions, such as ones that you may be offered from your cloud provider as a managed solution. All of them you can put under essential management, which is Rancher. And then from a central point, you can manage things like authentication, authorization, audit logging, monitoring, storage, um, security scanning. And of course, you can also manage the Kubernetes versions themselves, upgrade them, and so on. And this reduces the management overhead of all these different clusters by yeah, multiple factors. On top of that, Rancher also allows you, and you will see this a bit in the demo later on from Rob, it also allows you to not only manage the clusters, but also to have a nice and intuitive UI to manage the applications running inside of Kubernetes directly also there from the management interface, which makes it a lot easier to visualize what's running inside of your clusters, where it's running, especially for people who are not that familiar with the Kubernetes API, like for example, your development teams. One thing that you don't see here in this graph as a box is secret management. Secret management is very important for any kind of application uh, that you're running. Um, because you usually need to use and store things like passwords, certificates, API keys, and so on somewhere and make them available for your application somehow. And of course, because passwords, API keys, certificates are 
confidential information, you want to make them available to your applications in a way that is secure and also limits the access to it. So just putting, for example, a password into a public Git repository is a bad idea. Um, but even just putting a password somewhere in a file on a server could also even be a bad idea, especially if multiple different applications are running on the server in containers and you want to ensure that only the applications and only the developers and users who are supposed to use this credential, this password, the certificate, are able to access it. And if we have a look at what Kubernetes offers you in terms of secret management, there is a bit of secret management in Kubernetes, but it's very basic. It's basically just a key value store. So you can put your passwords, your certificates and Kubernetes secrets a key value store. And you can see this is the API definition of the Kubernetes object where you can put in passwords, for example. And there it works. You can then use the secret and put it into your Kubernetes cluster and then decide to which containers this content of the secret is mounted as environment variables or as volumes inside of containers. But it is, as I said, very limited, very basic. You don't have any encryption at rest there. Um, you don't have any encryption of the data. This is all plain text in the end. So everyone who can access the secret also knows the content from it. Um, and there is nothing in there, for example, in terms of helping you to rotate these secrets in when you want to do password or certificate rotation, or that helps you to manage these secrets across multiple clusters and keep them consistent if needed. So it can be a building block, but it's not the full solution you probably want to have in a production system. And that's where HashiCorp Vault comes in uh, that can help you with that. And yeah, maybe you want to take over here. Awesome. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. All right. So, um, as Bastian mentioned, there are uh, lots of different kinds of secrets, right? Your application needs, as soon as you deploy your application, probably it's a new service, needs access to certain APIs, needs an API key. Maybe it's a backend service, needs access to a database, needs credentials to a database, um, or a certificate, or something else, right? So there are lots of different kinds of secrets your application will always need. And how do you provide that secret, right, to your application? How do you kind of create a consistent workflow, a standard around that is what we are trying to solve as a challenge. But why is that a challenge, right? The, this is basically a secret or security challenge for us, right? When we give out passwords, right, for, for applications, say I am a developer and I want to deploy an application in Kubernetes, somebody needs to put that value inside, say, the Kubernetes secret. It means that that password has been manually handled by somebody. Maybe somebody put it on a post-it note, somebody put it in a configuration file um, and things like that. So that leads to a problem what we call a secret sprawl. That means that the secrets are somewhere uh, in our environment, in a Slack channel or in an email, and we have no control over where secrets are leaked or have a chance to get leaked. And sometimes they also get checked into Git repositories. And that is a very, very common thing that happens. And there are bots kind of scrolling uh, GitHub repositories, say, for example, for AWS credentials as well, right? So we all know and are aware of this problem. And somewhere down the line, mo most of us who have developed any code are also kind of uh, sometimes uh, at the wrong side of things because uh, it just happens because we we are just concentrating on some other task and we don't handle the password sometimes as responsible as we should be, right? All right, that's the secret sprawl problem. And then, all right, I have the first password, but then I need to rotate it, right? Uh, not only for compliance reasons, but generally it's a best practice to rotate your password. How do you make sure that you're rotating the password? What kind of checks do you put in place? 
how do you make sure that so many thousands of applications that you have running are getting new secrets every time, right? So that's kind of a bigger challenge to solve as to how can I really make that happen for my, my environment. And uh, one more problem I see is many times, say for example, a database is used by many applications, right? So once you give that password to all the applications, it is very difficult to find out which application really leaked that password, right? Because every application that you're is using that database is using the same password, right? So those kind of problems are also need to be addressed and solved so that actually when some leak happens, you can eventually go and find out the application which was responsible to, to leak that username or password that you were using. Then, you have lots of different certificates. How can you manage those certificates? The certificates on your Kubernetes cluster itself, um, access to SSH or cloud environment. So your pods probably need access to say S3 credentials. Do you then generate and put them in a secret or can you do that somehow dynamically, All right? Because your pod has an identity. So uh, kind of going in that direction of thinking as to how can we dynamically provide um, access to pods and, and, and get applications up and running or onboarded quickly with access to the passwords that they need. And then developers need to do cryptographic functions. They need to encrypt maybe some data here and there. Um, how, how can we provide that possibility to, to our developers? Now, we are talking about Kubernetes. Now let's think about a multi environment like Bastion previously mentioned, you don't have one Kubernetes cluster, right? You have many Kubernetes clusters, maybe running in different clouds and on-premise. So you don't have to solve the problem for one environment, but for many environments. So how can you standardize this process? Now, I talk a lot about um, getting things automated or how can we dynamically make this happen? But let's take a different view on the security point of view. Right. So if I am somebody who's responsible for the security of these environments, I want to have some kind of central visibility. I want to know which applications have access to which secrets, uh, which application don't have access to a secret. Can I audit that? Can I centrally manage that? Can I um, pull a plug if something happens? Can I re reduce access to certain systems if there is a certain incident that happens or an accident that happens, right? Can I connect my uh, HSMs or can I somehow make the secret management or creation of certificates, for example, more, more secure, more compliant using, uh, you know, by following, following some rules or regulations like FIPS compliance, for example, or other European regulations or GDPR compliance, right? So I'm, when I'm security person, I'm thinking about those things. And then at the end, everything comes down to how can I save costs, not only from breaches and loss of data, but also on, on my productivity of my, my teams who are deploying all these environments. And how can I scale this? Right? How can I make this a standard in my organization? So when we talk on a very, very high level, secret management doesn't look like such a big topic. But when we go deeper into the layers, it, it is actually a very, very critical part of any of your environments where you're running applications and you need tighter control around, around the secrets because this could eventually lead to, to breaches and, and loss of data, right? So just as a background as to why we are talking about this and why secret management is so important, especially in, in, in these new environments where, where everything is so dynamic. Right, and outside your perimeter. It's not just your own data center, but you have pods running everywhere and you don't have that perimeter of your own data center. So you need to kind of look into more zero trust kind of approaches around, around secret management as well. All right, so there comes Vault, right? That, that's where I want to introduce Vault, which can help us solve all those challenges and bring that dynamic environment or dynamic um, way of accessing secrets, uh, bring a standard workflow to secret management. The world has been there uh, for not that long in the industry, but has become really, really popular. 
Uh, today, Vault has more than 475 enterprise customers. So it's very, very well adopted in the enterprise space. So already a very mature product. And the early adopters were like most security products, the financial institutions, the banks, and most of the big banks already are using, using Vault, right? And that was on the enterprise side, but we see that Vault is also used and is very popular in the open source community. We see millions of downloads monthly, and uh, it has also become very, very popular in, say, Docker environments or Kubernetes environments or Rancher environments. And I will show you a static statistic in the next slide, which also kind of proves to us that that is actually the case. And then Vault is highly scalable. Vault is used by customers of ours like Adobe, which do 100 trillion transactions per year. So more than 2 trillion transactions weekly, which is a crazy amount of transactions. So a cloud native, highly scalable uh, application uh, can be, you know, you, uh, Vault can be used as that platform, which can be used by all the applications in your environment. So highly, highly scalable. And Vault addresses three major use cases. So secret management, of course, how do you store them? How do you protect your secrets? How do you provide applications access to those secrets? Uh, how do you revoke the access to the secrets? And then data encryption. So a lot of cryptographic functions, you can provide your data uh, developers with um, uh, encryption functions like APIs to encrypt or decrypt or sign, verify uh, kind of functions uh, directly to the developer. So they don't need to develop their own in cryptography and, and, and spend time on developing uh, that part, which is very, very difficult and must be done only by security experts. So we kind of take that over and, and do that for, for our uh, customers. And then we have a lot of advanced data protection features like you know encryption for VMware environments with KMIP or um, bring your own key use cases in the cloud environments or more more sophisticated uh, protection algorithms or encryption algorithms with format preserving encryption, tokenization, and things like that. So that's kind of in a nutshell, all the main use cases and how kind of Vault has become so popular among open source and enterprise customers. So this is a report that Datadog uh, frequently releases about containers. And you can see, um, you can also look at the report yourself. I have linked it here that what is in the top 10 containers. I was actually personally also surprised because uh, when I think about Mongo, MySQL, you know, they are of course very, very popular containers and it's no doubt, but Vault kind of sits next to them. It means that it has high adoption in the open source and also in the container environments that um, a lot of people are using Vault uh, beside all these other containers, which are of course, very, very well known, right? If we compare to say MySQL Vault is of course not that well known and that well used, but if, if we see this statistic, it kind of becomes clear that Vault is uh, kind of really coming up and being adopted very heavily. So that was for the open source uh, and developer kind of report, but also Gartner kind of created a new uh, section in their report for secret management because their section didn't exist before. And they realized that this has become a very, very prevalent topic in the enterprises. So they created a new scoring system in their uh, Gartner magic quadrants and stuff like that for privilege access management. Uh, so this is a specialized category, category that has been created and HashiCorp of course tops the list with, with a really, really good score there as well. All right, so you must have heard me say this already that um, we want to provide dynamic access. We want to create a standard workflow for all kinds of secret access, right? And I want to use this slide to, to show you or to give you an introduction to that workflow because it is very important to create a standard workflow when you are in this multi-cloud, multi-data center environment so that it can be adopted by all your teams and you can kind of adopt it as a pattern and use it again and again and not have everybody else uh, kind of scuff, build scaffolding or figure out themselves, right? So Vault kind of helps us do that. And the workflow has kind of three participants. You have a client, which could be a machine, a Kubernetes pod. So let's just take 
example of a Kubernetes pod. And the pod needs access to a, you can call it a secret, it could be static or a system, which could be a dynamic uh, environment or a dynamic access to a particular, say, AWS S3 credentials or the pod needs access to a database credentials or a certificate or a static key value store. So a pod could need a lot of different things, but to retrieve that secret, this pod or this client must identify itself, right? And luckily we have uh, an Kubernetes identification itself. So every Kubernetes pod can be given an identity using a service account, for example, right? So in this case for Kubernetes, I could use a service account and say, uh, identify this pod, pod and then authorize um, it based on the policy. So I need to say which pods, uh, or I can create roles and say this role has access to this database, this role has access to this S3 bucket, and then I could assign that role or connect that role with the service account in Kubernetes. And the workflow will remain the same, uh, right? if we have say um, some other um, secrets or some other authentication methods. So if you, you have a developer uh, or uh, administrator wanting to access database credentials, they could use LDAP or Azure AD or Okta to log into Vault and uh, generate or create, get access to the database administrator credentials. So client wants a secret, identifies themselves based on the authorization or policy, has gets then a token back with which it can retrieve the, the secrets which it is allowed to retrieve. And the workflow is always the same and it's a consistent workflow that can be adopted in the organization. Right? So I hope, I hope the workflow, I think this is the most important part of Vault. Once you understand this and kind of are bought into this, then it becomes easy to adopt Vault and then you just want to create this pattern again and again is, is my experience. So a, a bit more of a architectural view of Vault, of course, everything is an API. We have a UI, a CLI, which can be used. Uh, maybe uh, Rob will show that later in his uh, demonstration. And then we have the identity part, right? On the left, you see a lot of uh, personal or human-based identities. On the right, you see cloud identities or uh, machine identities. So Kubernetes is also part of that, which can be used in Rancher. And you can use, say, if you are using a serverless function, say uh, you're using a Lambda, it could be AWS identity. EC2 instance could use AWS AWS identity, IAM, and, and so on, right? And then uh, once I have identified, I need to write policies. So ACL policies, access control lists, uh, who has access to what, uh, which secrets can I get personally, or this, this client get. But it is also possible to write conditional policies like uh, only if you're coming from a certain IP address or a CIDR, um, given CIDR for IP addresses, you get access. Or after 9 p.m. on Friday, nobody gets access credentials to this database. So there could be lots of such things that you want to write to create more security around your secret access, right? For example, I can say only a Okta user using username um, whatever their username is, can get SSH access, but the username will remain the same. So they cannot log in as any other user when they're using SSH uh, secrets, for example, right? And everything is audited. Everything is written down in, in logs and we have different possibilities. You can also have uh, telemetry connections to your favorite telemetry. Uh, you can connect Splunk, for example, and that is an essential part, right, for security engineers, for security teams to, to collect the metrics and, and then figure out and make sure that they are able to create alerting around that or analysis around that. And data is very, very important uh, in those scenarios. And last but not the least, we have all the secrets, right? So, um, so I, I mentioned that we have possibility to do static secrets, right? So you have you can just write key value pairs, but you also have the possibility to do dynamic secrets. I have mentioned this a few times, but maybe we, we spend a bit of time here saying uh, you can connect uh, services like databases to Vault and provide them with uh, initial credentials to create new users, right? So, um, and then you can define roles which say, if a user logs in as an administrator role, they get 
one hour admin access to my MySQL da database. If the user logs in as a developer, they get six months read-only access to the database. So you can define the timeline um, or time to live for the credentials, and you can define which role gets which kind of credentials, and you can define those queries. And that way you do not have the problem of secret sprawl, and you do not have the problem to rotate the secrets because every time the secret expires, they are automatically deleted and a new secret needs to be requested by the client every time. So that way you make your system really secure and dynamic and which can be applied to cloud credentials or certificates or SSH access or active directory credentials and things like that. And lastly, we have all the crypto functions, encrypt, decrypt, verify, sign, format preserving encryption, KMA functionality, and the like. So just in a nutshell, what all Vault has to, has to offer. Um, and um, I hope uh, if you are new to Vault, you've got some idea as to uh, where Vault can really take you. And now I will hand it over to Rob, who will talk about how you can combine Rancher, which Bastian talked about earlier, and Vault together and kind of create a more secure Kubernetes solution uh, for yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Kapil. <clears throat> good, uh, good explanation. I saw, by the way, in the chat that there's a couple of questions there. So maybe, Kapil, you can answer them uh, in text. Otherwise, at the end of the session, we have another 15 minutes or so to, uh, to see uh, if we can answer them for you. Let me try to share my screen. And there we go. So um, yeah, indeed, uh, just to explain a bit, uh, we're, uh, I'm Robert from Advenus. We are independent of both HashiCorp and SUSE, uh, but we do like these products. Um, I've got a sh short demo prepared just to briefly go over these topics, not too deep by the way, but uh, probably just interesting to see, to get some, uh, some picture of, uh, of how these things work. Uh, yeah, why, why would you even combine them? Uh, they're both, they both have a very good API, so you can, uh, can use that to systematically approach uh, these systems. And uh, what, so it's sort of in the DNA of Advenus is we do not like vendor lock-in that much. Um, so we think both these products prevent that and that helps. Of course, you have to buy into something somewhere. Uh, but these products allow you to move to a different cloud provider, for example. So you don't, uh, you're, you're not locked in in the end. And yeah, with Rancher, you will deploy probably many Kubernetes clusters. So these secrets will become more and more important. Um, yeah, you basically can't, can't live without something like Vault. There are some alternatives. We are a massive fan of Vault. So in the demo, in a moment, we'll do this together. And I just stole this from the documentation, by the way. Yeah? Vault is very well documented. There's lots of learn uh, things too. So learn.hashicorp.com. You can try many things uh, just to get a better understanding of this product. Vault is a, yeah, let's say a hard nut to crack. Yeah? So it is a bit more abstract than something like Rancher. Um, You'll see that indeed this be one of the questions in the chat was, uh, hey, that uh, if it contains all these uh, credentials and secrets, that's probably pretty important. Has it been audited and tested? You will indeed see that once people start to use Vault, Vault will become super critical. If Vault is down, basically nothing can, can communicate anymore after a while. Vault has many, many capabilities to scale and uh, set up DR and uh, production replica uh, performance replication. So well under control, but it's uh, in the demo we'll do in a moment, we'll set up a uh, Vault server in the dev mode, which is a single one. And uh, it's all opened up and everything's ready. So very nice for a demo, not for production uh, use. So let me try to, uh, to demo a bit. If everything fails, uh, I got some video prepared. Let's see what we need. So um, let's start with Rancher. So I set up a separate machine somewhere, installed Docker on it, and uh, in there I installed Rancher, a single installation. It's not production ready, but good for this demo. 
And I did a few things already just to prepare because uh, yeah, it's a bit scary, of course, to do everything live. I, um, I gave Rancher some cloud credentials. They are hidden here. And that means I can now spin up stuff on DigitalOcean in this case. Just to show you a bit, there's many uh, cloud providers that you could use or could hook up to. So it's not just DigitalOcean, of course. DigitalOcean is a, if, even a bit of a weird decision. Eh? It's a very small cloud provider, but for me, it's very simple. So, so I like it. So at least I, I gave uh, some stuff here to, to allow Rancher to spin up uh, nodes in a bit. Then I also created uh, a couple of templates, node templates, these are called. And um, some are small and some are medium. Uh, you'll see, I'll make a cluster in a moment that uh, in the picture that uh, Bastian showed, there's a couple of functions in each cluster. Some of these functions can do fine with a small or a couple of gigabytes uh, instance. Others need, some, need a much bigger than that. I'll, I'll get into a bit of detail later. So that's prepared. And I'm not, not going to do that now, but uh, just so you know, uh, it does not come out of the box like this. I took a couple of minutes to set this up on forehand. And besides that, I created a cluster already. Uh, that's nice. So if, if I will create a cluster now, that will take 10 minutes or so, a bit long for the demo. I'll go through it, uh, but I'm not sure if we get to see the end of it. Um, let's, let's make one so you get to see what I mean. In this case, DigitalOcean once again, but as you can see, there are many. You can also use existing ones or uh, yeah, provided ones, basically. In this case, DigitalOcean. It should have a name. I think I gave the first cluster a name, my cluster minus one. So this will be my cluster minus two. And you see there's a couple of uh, roles that need to be configured. So let's start with etcd. That's the data storage. And I call it etcd minus, uh, minus and it, uh, Rancher will add a one and a two, et cetera. For etcd, we need one, three, or five. So you could already guess this is quite important. It's a clustered server. So I think three is sort of the minimum. I would never do with one. We also need control plane. Uh, and there we need one or more. Well, let's try one. Because I'm on the demo account, so I don't have infinite resources. And I need a worker. And of those, I probably need a bit more. I'll come back to that later. So these two functions, etcd and control plane, they can probably do with a bit of a small template. I guess maybe Bastian knows by the top of his head, but something like four gigs or so is good enough. A couple of CPUs should do. And the workers where the actual workload lands on, so the containers, and they require a bit more space because uh, you lose a bit of overhead. And this is a bit of a balancing act. So if you choose I think the large one, I make 256 gigabytes. If I would choose that, first of all, my boss would not be super happy because it's quite pricey for this demo. Uh, but you probably want at least two. So you can migrate resources over from one to the other. Having a very large installation with just two nodes means I, I lose 50%. So this is a bit of a balancing act. I'll pick medium now. And it really depends on the environment. You can set a lot of options here. And, um, and yeah, you could. Uh, by default, everything is pretty good out of the box. So create. So it will now go out to the cloud provider, in this case, DigitalOcean, and make machines, start them up, and etc. And this is a bit of a scary part, because uh, it it could go wrong, basically, and Rancher will fix it all. So that's that's sort of a, a massive, uh, nice feature. Uh, spinning up these nodes takes a while, and uh, you basically depend on a bit more than just Rancher. So, for example, last week or so, the week before, I spun up a few machines just like this, uh, based on Ubuntu, and they all started failing and failing. I was like, what? Why? <laughs> why Rancher? Why? But actually, uh, a repository for package installations was down to just an Ubuntu issue. And it started working after a while. And if it doesn't work uh, for a single uh, 
node here and there, that's fine too. Renshi will destroy it and add it again. So that's fine. And as you can see, one is active and that is a bit of a lie. Rancher does five machines at a time. So once the first one of these five ones says provisioning is ready, um, the, this one will be created and added to the cluster. So this takes a couple of minutes. Um, and as I say that these workers are a bit of a balancing act. So now I picked 16 gigs for this demo. It's more and more than enough. Um, yeah. For example, you lose about a gigabyte or so just on the operating system. So if you would pick this too small, that's a bit of an issue. So you see some stuff happening. I'm pretty sure, by the way, that uh, Ranch will fix this for me. I'm not sure how yet, but uh, it will figure it out. And that's, uh, to me, uh, as sort of a systems guy, yeah, I like to see this. This is a lot of fun. Anyway. We'll figure this out. This cluster two will probably be ready at some stage. And uh, so we can use it. I've prepared that cluster one already. So that should be a bit easier. Let's sort of review. So Arancha created all these things, CP1, etcd one etc. And I'm not sure on what, uh, what sizes they have. It doesn't really matter also. It was small, I'm not 100% sure what it means. This is 16 gigabytes, should be enough. So this is the rancher perspective. And yeah, just as Bastian was already saying, it used to be quite difficult to make Kubernetes clusters. Eh? So it was sort of a special task. There's probably a department in, in a company that does that for you. And now it's become so super easy. Uh, why not give everyone that thinks he wants a, a cluster, give them a cluster. That's a possibility. Uh, the only thing that stops you is basically cost or, or resources or so. But uh, as Bastian was saying, uh, Rancher can do with millions of clusters. Well, I think probably having literally millions is a bit of a, a nightmare to scroll and so on. But let's say a thousand or so, it's not, it's not a problem at all. So it changes the, the perspective a bit. Eh? So it used to be quite difficult and specialized work, specialized work to maintain, to make and maintain these Kubernetes clusters. And now it's a few clicks. Plus there's an API. So you could, you could even add some kind of a self-service capability, maybe some kind of a portal where people could request their Kubernetes clusters based on a few types of input. So in my opinion, a bit of a game changer. Nice, let's briefly have a look. I'm sort of curious what's happening here. Yeah, that's probably gonna work. Who knows? It doesn't matter. So far, uh, Rancher has always been able to fix stuff. So that's that's cool. Anyway, so that should give you a small insight, not too much detail on the clustering. There are lots and lots of features. So uh, it's much more than this uh, five or 10 minute demo or so. Uh, we can also go into the cluster and have a look here. So this shows just one cluster and what's running on it and how this thing is doing. So I created this apparently 18 hours ago and it's nothing to really nothing is running on it. Now for Vault, there's many, many scenarios that, that I could try to demo or demo. Um, in this case, I picked the most simple one and it's the installation of Vault basically, uh, just to showcase a bit how this works. Probably you're never going to do it manual like I do now, but let's see. So I just click this, the kubectl shell, and it should give me a kubectl uh, with uh, pre-configured and nothing's really running out. Ctl get pods, nothing's there. So what we're going to do is to add a repository for Helm charts. These Helm charts, if you've never heard of them, uh, they are a description of the application. So what, what pods should be running, how, how are they connected, where do they store stuff, et cetera. And um, it, it comes down to sort of a package manager. Like in Linux, you have uh, opt repositories or yum repositories or DNF repositories. This is sort of the same. You get to pick from a catalog of, uh, of charts, Helm charts, basically. So for now, Helm repo add. HTTP, uh, sorry, the first the name, that's Hashicorp. Hashi so nice, we're going to deploy 
fault from HashiCorp's uh, repositories, that means they probably are tested and work and they maybe even have support. Uh, Helm.releases.hashicorp. That's been added. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, install it. I've copy pasted that one. It's a bit long. But I'm going to Helm install Vault from HashiCorp Vault and set a few variables. Once again, uh, these are non production values. Uh, this dev mode here means uh, everything is open and unsealed and initialized. A uh, bit of vault terminology, but it's not production ready. It's great for these demos, not for real life. But if you need to try this, if you want to try this, yes, try the dev mode. It speeds up things a lot. And in this case, it's going to um, get, download the containers and start the application. And that takes a minute or so. See, so you see the state is slowly changing. And I guess maybe there's watch here. So yeah, there is watch, so it saves us a bit of typing. Watch will uh, run this command every two seconds or so. Should be up any moment now. And um, probably I didn't really pay attention to this dashboard, Probably it's been updated already. Yeah, everything is at least running, probably nearly ready. Yeah, was, everything is ready. So I didn't pay good attention to the dashboard, but I guess we've got an extra few resources, an extra deployment here and there, so should be good. So this is just the installation. There's much, much more to Vault, of course, eh? but uh, this is just a, the minimum I could demo in these uh, couple of minutes or so. Um, let's briefly go back to the presentation. By the way, uh, in this video, I think Janis from uh, Advenis will probably send this presentation. In this video, there's a bit more. And let me remind me that I should publish that uh, video before you can, uh, can view it. So there's a bit more in that uh, that should help you understand it. Um, yeah, a bit a bit more in detail. Eh? So Rancher uh, makes Kubernetes clusters and Vault can also hook up to these Kubernetes clusters as an authentication provider. Typically see something like Active Directory or some other provider there. Kubernetes is there too. So that's quite a nice fit. Um, let's briefly, oh, I cannot click. Ah, can I click? No, I, well, I can't click in this uh, presentation. But there's a more explanation here how to set it up. And once again, eh, the documentation for Vault is really good. Uh, Vault is not an easy topic, uh, but as if you spend sufficient time, you'll absolutely get the answers you want from the documentation. And there are a couple of methods to put these secrets into the container. I'll briefly touch upon them. One is to use a specific set of annotations. Uh, that allow to allow Vault to dump a secret, and in this case, in uh, some kind of a database uh, configuration. There's more documentation here, so have a look. The presentation will be sent to you. And a bit of a newer one, I think it was beta or is beta. Kapil, is it still beta? I think it's out of beta by now, right? Yes, it's not in beta anymore. It's because the experience I have is quite good, actually. I mean, it uh, seems to work. It's pretty simple. Uh, you spin up a container and it gets a file mounted into it with that secret that Vaults provides. So that could be uh, used for your application, for example, to pick up that secret and connect to, I don't know, the database or so. So really pretty simple and pretty good. I think it was just better because that's the way of working. It's it's never been really unstable or unusable or so. So yeah, just to summarize a bit, uh, it was a bit brief, but uh, yeah, you can install Vault very easily using these Helm charts created by HashiCorp. Um, you can add these service accounts in Kubernetes and Vault can use them. Um, and you can either use the annotations to inject some kind of secret or the CSI driver. 
there's much, much more to vault. Uh, but I mean, we've got only 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. Hope that uh, gives you a bit of information. There's some resources here that you can view. And I think it's time for the Q&A. Janis, if you can take over, then I'll look at if there's people having some questions and we can start the Q&A. Yeah, I think all the questions are already answered in the, in the Q&A section. So that's the great work from everyone. And let me just check if anybody has a question, we will like maybe stay five more minutes in here just to yeah. let people maybe type it out because yeah, we, we only, have, uh, only have that option. And of course you will all get the slides, you will have access to the videos um, that Rob has on, the, on his part of the slides. And if you have any questions later on, so not, not right now, you can of course send us an email, which is also, I think all the, all the email addresses from you guys are on there and also the, the general email addresses of HashiCorp, Susie and from Adfinis. So, yeah. Thanks all for participating, of course, eh? if you are dropping off. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.